Good morning. Grace to you and peace from the God who creates and redeems and sustains us. Welcome to the First Presbyterian Church this morning. I'm glad that everybody got your clocks set correctly. Um, and once you did that, still decided to get out of bed at uh, whatever time you had to do that. Um, it was a rough one for, for me, so I'm glad everybody's here this morning. Uh, a couple of announcements are before we get started with worship this morning. If you are joining us on Zoom, um, we're glad that you're here. Welcome. And uh, we ask you to put your prayer requests into the chat so that we can recognize those when we get to the prayers of the people. Girl Scout Troop 59 is assisting in worship today as liturgist. Today is Girl Scout Sunday, so the troop that meets here, uh, Troop 59, is going to be helping lead us in worship today. Um, and they have also um, are going to be helping with coffee hour after worship. Um, and I hear there's still a few Girl Scout cookie boxes left if anybody still needs some. So, um, Children's Church today is going to be led by Susan Spassif. Uh, Harry Rickards and Roger Kunga are running the AV desk today, and Mark Spassif and Batu are our counters today. So thank you, everybody, for helping make worship run as smoothly as it does. Bible study today will be after worship at 11.30, and a reminder that we also meet by Zoom on uh, 7.30 uh, on Thursday evenings, and the link for that is in the chimes. Palm Sunday brunch. Okay, that is coming up. Um, I have an announcement here. The Sign Up Genius is going to be in this week's chimes, um, so be on the lookout for that. Um, oh, that's not for me. Okay. Um, Palm Sunday Brunch is going to be in a couple of weeks. Bring a dish to share. That's going to be the Sign Up Genius. If you would like to bring something that is... Um, quintessential to your culture, that would be fantastic. We would love to make this um, an eclectic and an international uh, brunch as well. Uh, so Betsy's organizing the Sign Up Genius. It'll be on the chimes. If you don't have access to that, you can also talk to Cheryl, um, and she can um, just sort of keep track of that as well. Also at the Palm Sunday brunch, the annual Peeps Diorama Contest will be happening. <laughs> Lots of Peeps fans in the house this morning. All right, so uh, as a reminder of that, um, so, you know, the little Peep marshmallow things, um, create a diorama in your favorite biblical scene, um, and we will all enjoy those on Palm Sunday brunch. I don't, do we judge those? People get to vote. Okay, so everyone gets to judge those and vote on those um, at the Palm Sunday brunch. That's going to be a good time. The uh, food cupboard is requesting pasta and tomato soup for the month of March. Um, the donation bin for that is in the vestibule to Westminster Hall. And as a reminder, tea, coffee, canned foods, always welcome as well. If you have not made your name tag yet, um, there's still a couple of opportunities to do that um, at coffee hour today. Um, it's great to see everybody having theirs on. Um, so I good for me to know that I actually do know most everyone's names at this point, um, but it's always nice to have that confirmation. All right, um, committees. Um, committees would always love to have support, and so over the next several um, weeks, we're going to be inviting committee heads to come up and sort of talk about what their committees are doing. Um, so we're going to do that today. Um, and Harry Rickards is going to come up, and he's going to talk about his chair or his committee that he chairs, which is the discipleship committee. So, yeah, come on up. Before I start with uh, the, the Discipleship Committee, I do need to tell you that we recognize that there was a problem with the annual reports. Uh, there was a month's worth of records that had not been included. We have added those records and have reprinted those annual reports. And at the end of the service, if you would like a copy, if you will come up to the front, uh, Mark Spassif 
will have them and he and I will work together to get them redistributed to you. Okay, now, discipleship. The first and most important announcement is to let you know there will be an egg hunt this year. Okay. <laughs> uh, I don't have all the details on that as yet, but we will have an, uh, an egg hunt at the end of the worship service on Easter Sunday. Session recently renamed the Christian Ed Committee to Discipleship. The reason that was done is if I talk with most of you and ask you what Christian Ed does, you would tell me that we're responsible for the children's Sunday school program. Uh, and discipleship is a much broader concept. It focuses on both the children and on adults and in training in becoming and knowing more about what our heritage is as believers in Christ. The function that discipleship provides is in the process of changing because as we recently became a Matthew 25 congregation, the implications of that and the training that would be involved with that is now being determined. And there are, you will see information about some studies and other things that are going to be available. I do want you to understand that on Sunday morning, when the children leave during the, at the, after the children's sermon, that is not Sunday school. That's children's worship. It is a worship program designed for the kids. It is not Sunday school. We are trying to determine at this point what we're going to end up doing as a Sunday school class for the kids. But again, that is all evolving. And speaking of evolving, we need your input. We need you to consider becoming a member of the discipleship committee to help steer exactly what is going on and how this is being developed. We welcome members. If you look in the chimes, you, it will tell you that set the discipleship committee meets the first Wednesday of each month, and there is a link that's included in the chimes that you can link on. Even if you don't want to join the committee, you can join the meeting, and you can have some input into and, and comment on uh, what we're talking about. So we need your help, um, and it is evolving and growing and we're excited about what is ahead for us in the future. Thank you. All right, thank you, Harry. A couple more announcements, we're almost done. Uh, Easter flower order forms are in the narthex and they are also with Patty and with Cheryl and with Ryda and I know there's a F Lois, so many people. Uh, so if you would like to order um, Easter flowers, there's still two weeks left to do that. The last day is March 22nd. Um, reminder that we are a Matthew 25 congregation, as Harry talked about. More information will be coming out about that in the coming weeks. If you are visiting with us this morning, we want to say welcome. We are glad that you are here. Uh, we want to invite you to coffee hour after worship to come and to um, just sort of hang out, get to know everybody a little bit better. Uh, Again, if you see an unfamiliar face, please be sure to introduce yourself. I think those are all of the announcements this morning, um, so let us begin with worship. Please join me in the call to worship. On our worst days, God is good. On our best days, God is good. When life is consistent, God is good. And when life turns on its head, God is good. Day and night, Monday through Sunday, God is good, God is here, God is love. Hold tight to that good news. Let us worship God. 
And please join me in the gathering prayer. God of all seasons, our lives of faith ebb and flow like the tides of the ocean. On our good days, let us worship. On our bad days, let us worship. Whenever today is for each of us, we come to worship you in hope, acceptance, and relief. Amen. The hymn, the first hymn is God is So Good and can be found in your insert. There's a moment in our scripture today when Jesus turns to Peter, named the rock of the church, and says, get behind me, Satan. I don't know about you, but that seems like a pretty bad day for Peter. It is a pretty bad day when Jesus calls you Satan. Fortunately, this absurd moment comforts us with the knowledge that even Peter made mistakes. Peter, who was given the keys to heaven, Peter, Jesus' right-hand man, made mistakes just like each of us. And still, Jesus chose him. Knowing that, let us speak honestly with God, for even on our worst days, we belong to God, and that will not change. Let us pray together. Holy God, we often find ourselves moving through a world that does not make sense. Like Peter, we want to yell out, this should not happen. We want to control scenarios beyond our reach. We want to hold your world in our hands. Forgive us for the moments when we lead with declarations instead of curiosity. Forgive us for arguing when we could listen. Forgive us for fixating on one truth when we could open ourselves up to many. Soften our hard edges and teach us how to listen. With hope in our hearts, we pray. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Friends, no matter how many times you have dug your heels in, no, how, no matter how many fights you have wanted to pick with God, no matter how many times you have disagreed, raged, or clung to what you know instead of embracing holy change, we worship a God of grace. Nothing can separate us from God's love, not even a stubborn attitude or a tense heart. So hear and believe the good news of the gospel. God's love for us will always be deeper than we can imagine. We are seen, we are loved, and we are forgiven. Now follow Peter and go be the church in the world. Amen.
join me in the prayer of illumination. Listening, God, if we could attach ourselves to you, we would. We would scribble your scripture into our tender hearts. We would weave your good news into the fiber of our being. We would bind ourselves to you, but instead we wander. Instead of attaching ourselves to you, we find ourselves swept up in the business of the day. Like a seesaw of faithfulness, we move back and forth, up and down, constantly trying to find you in the midst of it all. So clearly speak to us now. Quiet the distractions long enough for us to affix ourselves to you. We are listening. We are hungry. We are hopeful. Amen. The first scripture reading comes from Psalm 107. The redeemed of the Lord say so. Those who he redeemed from trouble and gathered from, in, from the lands, from the east, from the west, from the south, and from the north. Some were sick through their sinful ways, and because of their in, inequities, endured affliction, they loathed any kind of food, and they drew near the gates of death. When they cried to the Lord in their trouble and saved him from their distress, when he sent out his word and healed them and delivered them from destruction, let them thank the Lord for his, for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind.
Right. Yeah? I'm going to invite our youth and children to come up. Come on down. Good morning. Thanks for reading, by the way. Good morning. How's everybody doing today? Good, good. Thanks for coming up today. So in Children's Church today, I think you guys are going to be actually talking about the passage that we read last week. Um, so what I thought I did, would do, instead of completely confusing you with a different passage, I would read one of my favorite books by one of my favorite authors called What is God Like? Um, everybody has that question, right? What is God like? What, how do we think of God? Is it a person? Is it a thing? A feeling? And so this book, I think, does a pretty good job of explaining that. So. It's got some pretty good illustrations, too. Everybody see? All right. If you can't see, try to get to a spot where you can. So i, I got to be able to read it, too. All right. So what is God like? That's a very big question. One that people from places all around the world have wondered about since the beginning of time. While nobody has seen all of God, because God is so big, God is too big for any of us to see fully. We can know, though, what God is like. So we get some examples. God is like an eagle, sharp-eyed and swift, with wings so wide you can play underneath their shadows. God is like a river, constant and life-giving. When you grow near God, you'll sprout up strong as a tree. God is like the stars forever, present and bright. Even when they feel far away, you can always look up and see them winking at you. God is like a shepherd, brave and good, a protector who loves her sheep so much that she watches over all of them and knows each of their names by heart. I kind of like that one. God is like a fort, strong and secure with walls that are mighty and safe. Inside, there are hidden places to hold you when you're scared or need a quiet place to rest. Anybody here built a blanket fort before? Yeah, it's fun, right? Yeah, here's a good one. God is like a gardener, patient and nurturing. God plants, waters, weeds, and fertilizes the earth until every good thing on it seeks the nourishing sun and grows. God is like the flame of a candle, warm and inviting. With God close by, you can look to the light and see through the darkness of nights. God is like the wind, passionate and full of mystery. God is both here and mysteriously also over there. God is everywhere. Swirling throughout the world, whistling across the mountain ranges, rustling through trees and pressing against your cheeks on a breezy day. I think it's supposed to be windy later today, so keep that in mind. God is like an artif, artist, creative and unpredict, unpredictable, always busy making and remaking everything, brilliant and new. It can be a little messy, though, right? God is like a mother, strong and safe. You can crawl up into her lap whenever you want to, and she will hold you until you fall asleep. God is like a father, gentle and safe. He will put you on top of his shoulders to give you a bird's eye view of all creation. Sounds fun. God is like three dancers, graceful and precise. They move to the same music in very different ways, showcasing all of God's elegance and rhythm in your life. So you got three dancers. God is like a rainbow, vivid and full of color, a dazzling reminder of promise and hope for all people after a storm. God is like a best friend, faithful and true, closer to you than your brothers and sisters. I think that's a good thing sometimes, right? Yeah. And because we know God, because we know what God is like, we know that... God is kind, God is forgiving, 
God is slow to get angry. God is quick to be glad. God is happy when you tell the truth and sad when things are unfair. That sounds about right. She is your protector. He is trustworthy. And they are friends when you feel alone. God hopes and God perseveres. So what is God like? That's a very big question, one that people from places all around the world throughout all time have answered in many different ways. Keep searching, keep wondering, keep learning about God. But whenever you aren't sure what God is like, think about what makes you feel safe, what makes you feel brave, and what makes you feel loved, because that is what God is like. The end. All right. Did anybody have any favorite things that God was like in there? Your mother? Yes. Yeah, mother. Okay. Yeah. Any others? That's all right. Yeah. Like an eagle. Yeah, that's a kind of a cool one, right? Good to think about whenever you see birds flying up in the air. God's like that too. Yeah. You have two parakeets? That's fun. So you can think about that then too, right? All right, will you guys say a prayer with me? Holy God, thank you for being like so many things and for helping us to be brave and kind and loving. Amen. All right, thanks for coming down, everybody. If you guys want to go to Children's Church, you can go with Miss Sue. She's coming down right now. Hey, buddy. All right. Good morning again. So if you remember back to last week, great. If not, that's okay. We spent our time uh, with the Apostle Peter and the, the disciples as they were traveling with Jesus to the region of Caesarea Philippi. It was in that story that they were having a conversation about who the Son of Man was. Jesus had asked them this question, and then made a distinct turn and asked the disciples who they thought he was specifically, who they thought Jesus was. And so the responses of John the Baptist or Elijah or Jeremiah then became something else. Peter, alone amongst the disciples, made the connection that Jesus was the Messiah. And then we spent some time talking about what that meant for Peter to call Jesus the Messiah. We discussed a little bit about Jesus' remarks that this claim is the rock upon which the church would be built. Today's passage is literally the very next verses in Matthew's gospel. Peter has just claimed and identified Jesus, given his true identity as the anointed Messiah, the Christ. And the traditional interpretation of this passage is one that it's, it's one of the ways in which the, the primacy of the apostolic succession through Peter, through Peter get it, gets its legitimacy from. In other words, the reason that people believe that Peter was the first pope um, has a lot to do with this passage here. But what we're going to see today is that that sort of high watermark for Peter is very short-lived. Um, so listen now for the word of the Lord. This is Matthew 16, 21 through 23. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and to undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. And on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Poor Peter. 
He can't catch a break. I think it is telling how we read last week's passage as separate and distinct from today's passage, and even the verses that come right after today's passage, verses 24 through, what is that, 28. I think there is a case, though, to be made that all of this is really one larger story that Matthew's Jesus is trying to convey to us. In a lot of ways, one of the major goals of the Gospels in general, all four of them, is to try to explain to their audience, to their readers, to their listeners, that Jesus is who they claim him to be. The claim that Jesus is the Messiah is a pretty big claim, and is one that you can't just make without proof or evidence to back that up. And so up until this point in the Gospel, We've been spending a lot of time reading or listening to things that Jesus did or words that Jesus said or things that people said about Jesus or things that happened because of him leading up to this point. The point that the identity of Jesus as the anointed, the Christ, the Messiah, has merit to it. Remember, most folks were skeptical of this claim and for good reason. People claiming to be the Jewish Messiah, or people claiming that their leader was the Jewish Messiah, had been going on for centuries at this point. Most famous person before Jesus, perhaps in relatively recent Jewish history, was Judas Maccabees, who had led the Maccabean Revolt, um, in a lot of ways fit that description of Jewish Messiah more than Jesus ever would. For those who have forgotten, Judas Maccabees led an armed resistance against the Roman Empire in about 160 BCE. And that was what the Messiah was supposed to do, lead these armed revolts, become sort of a militaristic leader that would make themselves, uh, that would, what's the word I'm looking for here? bring freedom and liberation to the Jewish people. Wow. And so when the claim of messiahship comes up for Jesus, you have that baggage and expectation attached to it. You have this expectation that this person, either single-handedly or through starting a movement, will regain Jewish independence of the land, of the Holy Land. And so when Peter claims that Jesus is the messiah, that makes sense then, or it's at least highly plausible that that is what Peter's expectation of that claim would be. As a matter of fact, one scholar, uh, Larry Hel Hellyer, writes in his book that's entirely about the Apostle Peter, he says, quote, Peter almost certainly harbors nationalistic hopes for the Jesus movement. And so when Peter makes that claim about Jesus being the Messiah, he's correct, but not in the way that he thinks he is. So Jesus begins trying to teach not just him, but also the other disciples and show them that this is a yes, but sort of thing. And so we're told in today's passage that Jesus begins to teach Peter and the disciples about how he must go into Jerusalem, but then undergo suffering at the hands of the leaders and to be killed and then raised on the third day. And it's at this point that Peter gets upset. He pulls Jesus aside and says, that's not how this is supposed to work. He says, Messiahs don't go to Jerusalem to suffer and die. Messiahs go to Jerusalem to take over. And it's at this point that we get this infamous line from Jesus, Get behind me, Satan. Mm. Now it's important to pause and to say here what this accusation is, what it means, and what it doesn't mean. Let's start with what it doesn't mean. It does not mean that Jesus is calling Peter the devil. Peter has not instantaneously been identified with or accused of being a humanoid figure with horns and a long pointy tail and a pitchfork and the person who leads you into eternal conscious torment for all eternity if you have lived 
a bad life on earth. He's not saying that. In fact, that depiction of, or the idea of who Satan is as that sort of image was not around during Jesus' lifetime. The idea of a singular personification of the existence of all evil was not part of their mental framework. It was not there yet. In fact, the idea of hell, as we commonly think about it today, was not around during Jesus' lifetime. We, start, we were starting to get some hints of it, sort of hints of this duality of the afterlife at this point, but really it is not until we get things like Dante's Inferno in the Middle Ages that this idea takes off of sort of hell how movies depict it today. But that is going down a separate rabbit hole, and so we will stop there. But what it does mean, the concept behind Hasatan in Jewish thought at this point was much more nuanced. The basic idea of it, though, is that Hasatan was part of Yahweh's divine counsel. In fact, you see this concept if you go back to the book of Job and see how this figure, this Satan, shows up there. It is under God's, Yahweh's, direct command that Hasatan does to Job what he does. So the title, because the title, if we translate Hasatan into English, is uh, we get something more along the lines of the adversary, or the tempter, or the accuser. It is a title with a specific action tied to it. It is not the personification of all evil. And so what Jesus says Peter is doing here is that he is tempting Jesus not to go through with the plan. In Matthew, Jesus has foreknowledge of how everything is going to take place. Whether that is Matthew's spin on the text or reality is not our concern. Our concern is that Peter has one understanding of what the role and the impact of the Messiah will be, and Jesus has an entirely different understanding of who the Messiah will be. And we see this if we look just those few verses forward in the text. Once Jesus is done rebuking Peter, he turns directly to his disciples and says, If any of you want to become my followers, you will take up your cross and follow me. For those who want to lose their life, for those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. Jesus is doing his level best to try and to make it plain for the disciples that he is going to Jerusalem and that is not going to go the way that they might think that it will. He is trying to both manage expectations and set new expectations for what his kingdom will look like. For Jesus and for Matthew, a large part of that kingdom, of that identification as a follower of Christ, it will mean sacrifice. Jesus goes so far as to say that that sacrifice will mean taking up their own cross. That following Jesus will be both rebellious and revolutionary, but that that change is not going to happen with a weapon or on a battlefield. It is going to happen in their hearts, in their minds, and in their souls. As I was thinking about this this week, this change in hearts and minds that Jesus is trying to do with the disciples here, it is so much more of a difficult task than this brute forth message, uh, method of messiahship. And the way that I've been thinking about this week is actually, I think, sort of funny. So, as you may know, Allison and I have had one heck of a time over the last year trying to train our new dog. Sheffield. If you have not met him yet, Sheffield is somewhere between 55 and 60 pounds of Old English Sheepdog, who we think probably spent the first two years of his life living on the streets in Louisiana. He is high energy and has absolutely zero boundaries. And so 
training uh, and trying to calm him down to live in a house with human beings and to not just think about himself and only himself and his immediate impulses has been one of the most difficult things that I have ever had to do. <laughs> it got so bad after the first month that we knew we had to pull in professionals and get a trainer. And I have to say I contribute his success and his continued existence to our trainer's effectiveness and talent. But what I've been thinking about here is that there have been so many times when we have tried to take him out in public or try to take him on a walk or try to socialize him in any way, and all he wants to do is pull as hard as he can, jump on people, jump on other dogs, just want, jumping on tables, literally, try, when we try to take him out to like restaurants. Basically, his first impulse is just destruction. But over time, with training, and lots and lots of time and repetition, things are slowly getting better. We can take him into public a little bit more now. He seems to sometimes listen to what we say to him. But it is so much better for him and for me and for Allison if we can take him into public and he keeps all form paws on the ground of his own volition than if we have to grab his collar and keep him down with force. It's better for him not to pull on a walk so that he's not choking himself of his own volition than if we are literally holding him back as hard as we can. Making him use his brain and changing the way that he thinks about the world and his expectations of it are better for him and better for everyone else that he encounters. It is safer, it is more enjoyable, and it can be sometimes sweet and fun. If we don't have to do things by physical force, or coming back to what Jesus is doing with Peter and the disciples here, if we don't have to do things by violence or by militaristic power, if we can change people's hearts and minds to be more loving and more caring for each other, then the principles and the force and the machinations of a violent and oppressive empire will not be able to stand. In fact, they will be unnecessary for peace because violence and oppression cannot achieve peace. And in some ways, I think that is what we are doing for Lent. We use this as a time to step back and to think how our lives and our actions and our, how our thoughts impact not just ourselves, but also our communities and those around us. For sure, the temptation is there for us to want to use physical force to change things. We have seen that countless times over the last months and years, especially on the world stage. But what Jesus is saying, and in fact what Christianity has affirmed when it's at its best, is that we must change, or those cycles of violence will only continue to repeat. That we cannot fall into the temptation of force. But that we can change people's hearts and minds through our deeds, through our sacrifices, to make that kingdom that much closer. And so if this Lent season is the time that that switch happens for you to embrace that way of living, then thanks be to God. May we all continue to advocate for that kind of change in our world, in our communities, and with our neighbors. In the name of the God who creates and redeems and sustains us. Amen.
Please join me in the affirmation of faith. I believe in a God of second chances, a God who sees through my stubbornness and holds my fear with tenderness. I believe that this God of second chances uses ordinary people like Peter to do good in the world. Therefore, I believe and hope that God can use me too. I believe that from time to time, God invites us to imagine the impossible. I believe that from time to time, God invites us to change our minds. This change is holy and important work, although challenging. When fear and scarcity plague me, or when the impossible feels out of reach, I believe that God meets me with grace and invites me to follow. Thanks be to God for a love like that. Amen. Please be seated. Friends, we come now to our time of joys and concerns. Harry, do we have anything from Zoom this morning? Um, let's see. Uh, Janet Hinshaw Thomas was taken into the hospital, and we don't have any of the details on it, but she was admitted. She is the, the lady that we knew from Prime. Yes. God, in your mercy, for our prayer. A reminder that there is a sale from the repurpose shop today. All right, thank you. And a pray for Patty C. and Brian H. God, in your mercy, for our prayer. Friends, what other joys and concerns do we have this morning? Colin, Patty's got one up front here. I'm asking for continued prayers for my sister-in-law, Maria Varela. She just had a radical um, operation removing her whole right hip, and cancer is evidently still challenging. So thank you for keeping her in your prayers. God, in your mercy, our prayer. last two weeks, I've had viral bronchitis, so that's why I've been absent, but I'm feeling so much better today. Thank you, God. Glad you're feeling better. God, in your mercy, yeah. your prayer. Others? Friends, with this and more on our hearts and minds, let us go to God in prayer this morning. Eternal God, our story together is one of your unending faithfulness to us, even as we are not always faithful to you. Holy source of all that is good, you have shown us yourself in abundance, in mercy, in grace and abiding care. Knowing of your enduring providence, we may come to you with the concerns that weigh heavily on us. O oh God, we pray for world affairs far beyond our control. For the people of Ukraine and Gaza and Palestine and Israel, we pray for peace, knowing that you alone are the source of true shalom and the peaceable kingdom. Where there are those in harm's way, we pray protection. Where we ourselves harbor enmity and prejudice, we pray awareness and grace that we may learn forgiveness. Teach us how we may serve you more fully in ways that we cannot imagine. O oh God, for the needs closer to home and for our own community. As we go through this season of Lent, we ask that you open our eyes to the needs of our very doorstep. May we see those whose names are known to you, 
and offer compassion and goodwill. For victims of violence, gun violence in particular, we offer our prayers for those who seek solutions for intractable problems. Let us not give up hope. Let us not abandon the work of healing the world. We remember that all healing comes from you. We pray as well for ourselves, for our own material and spiritual needs. Where our members suffer from illness and affliction, grant your healing touch, bringing wholeness. For any in our midst who suffer from depression or addiction, give us understanding and compassion. For those who are lonely, may we be a place of friendship, a warm haven where love is shared. And so, holy God, to that end, we pray for your church, universal, Presbyterian, and our own congregation. Enrich our lives with your grace, that we may also be repairers of the breach. O oh God, we make all of these our prayers. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The invitation to the offering is this. From the providence of God, all that we need has been given to us, in sufficient abundance that we might share. Let us return our offerings as a sign of our commitment to follow the one who has loved us, even unto death.
gracious God, from the overflowing of your love, we have been giving abundance upon abundance. Receive, we pray, our offerings and bless them. May we be blessed by their work as we see your reign among us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please join us in our last hymn, O Jesus, I Have Promised, hymn number 388. <laughs> Here now our Lenten charge and benediction. Beloved wanderer, as you leave this place, may you carry your curious heart on your sleeve. May you look for God in every face. May you find the courage to get out of the boat, to run to the tomb, and to speak of your faith. And when the world falls apart, may you hear God's voice deep within, saying, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. You are called, you are blessed in both your ups and your downs. You always belong to God. So go now in peace, trusting in that good news. Amen. <laughs>